Spinal cord injury can bring devastation to the life of an individual. In an instant, a person can go from being fit and mobile to being paralysed and dependent. The management of such trauma requires specialist care to maximise the patient's potential. Care starts from the first contact. Whenever a spinal cord injury is suspected, the core principle is to stabilise the patient and protect the spinal cord from further damage. Spinal cord injury should be suspected until proven otherwise. Stabilisation is typically achieved by aligning the patient's spine, their head, shoulders, sternum and pelvis for transporting using braces, strapping, bags and tape. In some cases, correct handling at this stage will determine whether a patient will walk again. For the patient, this can be a frightening time. Okay, we're going to get you out of here, fella. The primary consideration for those in attendance after an injury is, is one of reassurance. Reassuring the individual as far as you can. Keeping them calm and communicating. Ready, steady, ready. The patient will be examined using ATLS, Advanced Trauma Life Support Protocol. Determining whether a patient does or does not have a spinal cord injury isn't always easy. The attending physician will determine whether x-rays are needed and, after clinical examination, whether other parts of the spine will be x-rayed, such as thoracic spine and the lumbosacral spine. A key consideration for clinicians is to clear the spine. Clearance of the spine may be said to occur when the clinician is satisfied after appropriate history, examination and investigation that the risk of an important injury being present is negligible. Plain x-rays are carried out using careful positioning and handling. Spinal injury patients can exhibit a raised shoulder position which must be corrected or it can mask certain vertebrae. At times, x-ray may be complemented by MRIs or CT scans. Even at an early stage, discussion with a specialist centre is often highly desirable. The unit was opened in 1984. It serves the whole of the southwest of England and covers a population of 11 million. We work as a multidisciplinary team with experienced and highly qualified staff to provide expertise in the acute phase from the day of injury, including accurate diagnosis, access to surgery, or conservative management. The centre encourages the wider use of the Asia Survey form, an international standard record of a patient's status. It's invaluable when care planning, seeking advice, or referring to a specialist centre. The Duke of Cornwall Spinal Injury Treatment Centre is the hub of specialist spinal cord injury care in the South West. It aims to provide advice to referring hospitals, specialist spinal surgery, conservative management of bony fractures, medical management in the acute phase, rehabilitation management, lifelong patient support and educational outreach services. The main causes of traumatic spinal cord injury that we see are RTAs, road traffic accidents, where patients present with either tetraplegia or paraplegia. Of those patients with non-traumatic spinal cord injury, we commonly see infections, tumours and predisposing degenerative conditions such as cervical spondylosis. As diagnosis is established, the treating consultant will establish the extent of the cord damage. Patients need to be approached about their diagnosis and prognosis, their present and predicted future. A patient's anxiety is often high at this time. Doctors breaking bad news have to be aware that patients already have some information. They're afraid, they want information, and they suck it up from wherever they can get it. So when the doctor comes to give the diagnosis, the patient's already got some information ahead of them. Bad news is difficult to give. You need space 
and you need time. It can't be something that's rushed. You need to have good communication skills. You need to be able to talk with the individual. You need to give them information, but you also need to check that they understand what you're saying. So you need to ask them what they've taken out of what you have said to them. That's very important. Make good eye contact, get on the same level as the individual. These are the foundations of, of good communication skills. The team at Salisbury seeks to support and advise other hospitals, assisting in their care of patients in the acute and post-acute stages. Diagnosis can be tricky and clinicians must adopt a different mindset. It is crucial to bear in mind when examining a spinal cord patient that many would have lost the ability to locate pain. To give an example, a shoulder pain in a complete thoracic injury could be pain referred from the abdominal area. Doctors should approach these patients with a different mindset and not expect to follow the rules of a classic diagnosis. Unless there is a contraindication, patients in the acute stage will be started on anticoagulation medicine, low molecular heparin and proton pump inhibitors for 12 weeks to prevent DVT and PE, as well as gastroduodenal bleed. But the treatment is tailored to each individual patient. They are monitored clinically daily and will be kept nil by mouth for the first 48 hours post-injury until bowel sounds are satisfactory due to issues with the paralytic ileus in the acute stage. A complete protocol is available from the Spinal Injury Centre's website. When patients are referred to the unit late, it's a sad fact that some arrive with avoidable secondary complications, such as bowel disorders and pressure sores. Our recent statistics tell us that 26% of patients admitted to the spinal centre have established pressure ulcers developed within two to four weeks of their injuries, and this is something that's completely avoidable. For patients that are being managed conservatively, on bed rest, the only way to prevent pressure ulcer development is to relieve the pressure, and the only way to do that is by turning these patients frequently and expertly. It's not really about relying on specialist equipment in terms of mattresses because you may not be able to utilise uh, something like an alternating pressure relieving mattress in the presence of an unstable injury for example. So what we're talking about here is turning the patient, the frequency of turns and the type of methods used for turning. For instance you may undertake pelvic twisting for patients which means you can rely on less numbers of nursing staff to undertake this but you can only do it for patients with cervical injuries or possibly high thoracic injury and no associated pelvic injuries or log rolling which is mainly for thoracolumbar injuries or for those on electric turning beds this can be done on each shift to facilitate a skin check for example these patients need to be carefully positioned with pillows to maintain their position and to prevent deformity and contractures, again maximising potential. Another key issue is breathing. Higher levels of spinal cord injury can lead to significant respiratory problems. Tetraplegia patients can experience paradoxical breathing, where the rib cage actually compresses on inspiration. Their vital capacity, respiratory rate, Oxygen saturations and arterial carbon dioxide levels are monitored to detect hypercapnic respiratory failure. If evident, this is initially managed with bilevel respiratory support, BiPAP, using a mask. This can sometimes prevent the need for intubation. If BiPAP is unsuccessful, or there are difficulties clearing secretions, an elective tracheostomy is indicated. Patients with a tracheostomy may have issues with swallowing, eating and communication, so input from speech and language therapists and dietetics is essential. We have a specialist swallowing team and facilities to have peg insertion readily available. The unit accepts patients with tracheostomy and helps to wean them from it. It also accepts patients who require long-term ventilation and works with local services to plan a comprehensive discharge. The centre has extensive knowledge of ventilation and respiration issues, plus the specialist personnel to assist patients with their breathing. Another area where complications are unnecessary and can be avoided is bladder and bowel management. Following a spinal cord lesion, it is likely that a patient will no longer be aware of the need to defecate. It is imperative that a comprehensive bowel assessment is carried out over a period of time.
An effective bowel regime achieves regular, predictable, complete emptying of the bowel at a socially acceptable time and place. Strong appearance or regular use of laxatives should be avoided as these may lead to episodes of faecal incontinence. Instead, emphasis should be placed on using effective manual techniques such as digital stimulation and or manual evacuation. Faecal incontinence can have a significant impact on the patient's psychological well-being and can lead to social isolation. This complication and others, such as constipation, can be avoided by achieving and adhering to a strict bowel regime that is tailored to the needs of the individual and ensures their comfort, dignity and safety. The patient's bladder is also paralysed. Soon after the injury, the bladder seizes up during the period of spinal shock and it shows no activity, no reflex. So the bladder is emptied via an indwelling catheter or intermittent catheter. Bladder pattern is monitored and at three months patients undergo video urodynamics to fine-tune bladder management. Among options available are indwelling urethral or suprapubic catheters, intermittent catheters, condom drainage, augmentation cystoplasty and Mitrofenov channel through the abdominal wall. During the acute stage, physiotherapy is concerned with the patient's respiratory management, managing the patient's soft tissues, preventing their muscles and joints from becoming stiff and losing range of movement. The physiotherapists are looking at strengthening patient's muscles, managing abnormal tone, educating the patients and developing a very special rapport Every patient on the spinal unit will be allocated a primary physiotherapist who will work with that patient throughout their whole time on the unit. We hope by using the system that the patient will be encouraged and motivated and enabled to achieve all the things that they are able to achieve and that they want to achieve. For tetraplegic patients, their hands are assessed and the appropriate treatments given. This might include splints to support joints and maintain a functional position. Occupational therapists also play an important part at the acute stage, providing appropriate assistance, ensuring patients can call for help, for example, or positioning mirrors for those on bed rest. Assistance may also involve fitting neoprene or thermoplastic splints to aid control. As patients progress from the acute management stage towards long-term rehabilitation, it can signify a positive psychological turning point. But staff must be aware of the potential psychological issues. I can see you're a bit restless tonight. It's just been going over and over and over in my mind. In the early stages after injury, the issues are to do with shock. What have I done to myself? How serious is it? This gives way, once they know they've got a spinal cord injury, to a chaotic series of emotions. There's no particular order to this. We call it the time of disintegration because their coping strategies disintegrate. After that, they either develop coping strategies or they develop one of three conditions, anxiety, depression or post-traumatic stress disorder. If staff find that people are talking about these symptoms of reliving accidents, the most important thing is not to block that, but to allow the individual to continue to talk about it. The more they talk about it, the better it is for them. So uh, fundamentally what staff have to be able to do is to be able to sit there and give the person time and space to actually talk about what they've been through and what they're thinking about. Okay, thank you. Would you like a drink? Yes, please. Okay. A real milestone for many patients is their first mobilisation out of bed, the first time they will sit in their chair. After relevant clinical and radiological assessments, the doctors will give the go-ahead for this. When the doctors have cleared the patient to mobilise out of bed for the first time, both the physiotherapist and the occupational therapist are very heavily involved in assisting the patient in their initial mobilisation out of bed. Preparation has occurred during the acute phase so that the patient knows what to expect and sees it as a way forward but not necessarily an easy way forward. The patient needs to be prepared 
They may need physical items such as collars and braces. They need psychological preparation for getting in, up into a wheelchair for the first time and feeling different. They need specialised equipment to sit into that suits their needs. The physiotherapist and occupational therapist spend a lot of time making sure that the patient is seated correctly with the right equipment in a chair that has been set up for their needs. Once the patient is mobilised, they may identify particular activities they wish to manage independently. This can often be achieved through learning a new technique or using adapted equipment. The occupational therapist works with the patients to maximise their independence in a range of daily living activities, including dressing, cleaning their teeth, writing and access to computers. Each patient has a rehabilitation support team, which includes their physician and nursing care representative, their physiotherapist and occupational therapist, a psychologist and a discharge coordinator. The team will harness the unit's extensive facilities to help patients achieve realistic goals and maximise their future potential. Sports such as swimming, table tennis and archery represent other ways in which an individual can explore potential new interests and new challenges. In the summer there are opportunities to go sailing or have a flying lesson at a nearby airfield. Organisations helping those who have a spinal cord injury, such as the Spinal Injuries Association, the Backup Trust and Aspire, visit the unit to give peer support and advice to patients and their families. There's also the Salisbury Spinal Injuries Trust, a charity dedicated to providing additional practical help to patients at the centre. There comes a point in the patient's rehabilitation when they start thinking about going home because it's that time. Now they've been here for a number of months, it's nice and safe, they've got used to the place. Suddenly they have to go outside and that is frightening. So the person really wants to go out there and try to restructure their life, but they're also very afraid to do that. And it's a very difficult time for them. It's a kind of push-me-pull-you. They want to do it, but they're afraid to do it. The patient meets with their goal planning team to discuss all aspects of their future needs, from housing and home adaptation to medical support, outpatients, and even for some, a return to work. And at that meeting, we set 23 goals. Planning for the time when a patient will be discharged is most effective when started early. As a discharge coordinator, we work with a larger team, which consists of physios, OTs, nurses and consultants. One of the things we have to look at is the need for care, depending on the level of injury that the, the person has, and the possibility of a patient needing housing. Good discharge planning is supporting a patient through the process and discharging them feeling confident and into a safe environment where they can be as independent as possible. Patients who have been through a period of rehabilitation at the Spinal Centre are discharged home with a comprehensive care plan. In addition, their community staff are invited to the centre to meet the patient prior to their discharge home to learn about the patient's care. A patient's personal care plan is the result of considerable work by the team and extensive experience with the patient. So it's essential that it be adhered to by community carers. Physios and occupational therapists are major contributors to this plan. The outpatient physiotherapy and occupational therapy staff work very closely together, providing primarily an assessment and management service. The issues that we address include things like posture and seating, home exercise programmes, provision of splints and braces. We also look at accommodation needs, employment and driving. A lot of the work that we do involves us with those who are ageing with their spinal injury. For example, those who have been able to transfer independently and now need to use a hoist, and those who have been able to walk independently but now need to use a wheelchair. The outpatient team also provide a service for those who have not been through a spinal treatment centre. The team recognise that the home and rehabilitation process usually involves the patient's family and friends, and therefore they become an important part of the team. Preparation for the first weekend at home includes the use of an adapted flat where the patient and their family can spend a night or a weekend away from the ward and gain confidence in their newly acquired skills. The occupational therapist advises on home adaptations and ensures that equipment is in place for weekend leave and eventual discharge. The centre offers a broad range of outpatient services and specialist clinics, including posture, seating, video eurodynamics, 
urology, and sexual function and fertility. Numerous couples have benefited from the fertility clinic and have gone on to have children. So support continues far beyond a patient's time at the unit. Community liaison will visit the patients routinely after discharge. Patients are also invited back to the spinal centre where they will be reviewed by the outpatient team. The services provided will play an integral part in the patient's health and well-being. For example, follow-up regarding their renal function, their skin integrity, bladder and bowel management. Our patients are provided with a lifelong follow-up. Advice can be given via the telephone, via email and from a variety of sources. Information can be sent out through the post. The spinal unit has its own website. Family and friends can play an important role in the patient's emotional and psychological well-being. They can also play a part in having a shared understanding of how someone's spinal cord injury affects the patient. Future support and resources may include telemedicine, which is being trialled, and other services to improve patient care. One area we are looking at developing is our outreach services. This is taking nurse-led services out into the community and seeing patients for routine follow-up more locally. Currently our patients all come back to Salisbury for their routine appointments and this initiative we hope will make our follow-up services much more efficient and effective. It will also reduce the patient's travelling time and length of wait for appointments. This film is part of the centre's ongoing outreach initiatives. The team seeks to extend its support for acute teams, rehabilitation centres and general medical practitioners to help reduce secondary complications and to encourage more timely referrals. After my accident, my life changed dramatically. I'd lost all of my independence. There were times when it was really frightening. And there was a lot of pain as well. But I had terrific support at Salisbury. They really looked after me, both mentally and physically. I think it was a very emotional time, not just for me, but for my family as well. I still see my consultant and my physio and all of the uh, outpatient team. And it's just great to have that sort of backup. I now realise that even though I'm in a wheelchair, I can still have a life.